Did you know that the average attention span of humans is currently sitting at 8.2 seconds? For comparison, the one of a goldfish is nine. No, I'm just kidding, this is a complete lie. It is nearly impossible to measure, let alone average attention span, for there are way too many variables at play when it comes to this. But you did believe me for a second there, didn't you? After all, those are the types of statistics that we keep writing scandalous articles about with titles in big, bold, red letters screaming at your face, human attention span, no lower than a goldfish. However, while the math is wrong, there is some truth behind the statement. It is getting harder to catch people's attention. Would it be during a casual conversation or a long lecture in class? We seem to be unable to stay focused on the task at hand. It is inevitable to admit that people are getting bored. But this time, we're not just bored of reading books or doing our homework. People are getting bored of the things they love, their passions. People are getting bored of living. There was even a study held about this from 2008 to 2017, where American researchers gathered kids from the ages of around 8th to 12th grade, and each year they asked them the question, what do you want to do with yourself in the future? And what they found was that the more time passed, the more disinterested those kids seemed to be in what was ahead of them. They didn't seem to care about the future at all. But I am here today for a reason, aren't I? I want to tell you exactly why this is happening and also provide you with a solution to the problem, if, of course, you'd be willing to spare me more than 8.2 seconds. With that, I welcome you to section one of three, the science behind the increasing boredom. Let me introduce you to a little something known as dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter, aka a signal that our neurons send in our brain to each other, and it is responsible for a lot of different functions, even, curiously enough, including our movements. And for different functions, there are different paths that it takes in the brain. Today we're examining the mesocortical limbic system, which includes two different pathways. The first one, is the mesolimbic tract, which is responsible for reinforcing behavior by, by accessing our reward system. What that means is when we do something that we like, it sends a signal in our brain, and the, our brain tells us, oh, I enjoyed that, do it again. That's how reinforcement happens. The second tract is the mesocortical one, which is the exact opposite of the mesolimbic one, because it is responsible for executive functions. What those are, are tasks that require a lot more effort, time, and concentration, and overall are harder to do. For example, take making a project that requires multiple steps, like writing a paper, doing a presentation, then giving a speech like I am today. We're not necessarily enjoying or getting rewarded for each step of the task, but we still do it thanks to our mesocortical tract, because it pushes us to do it. In simpler terms, the mesolimbic path is what we want to do, the mesocortical path is what we have to do. Now, let's apply the science that we just learned to the problem at hand. Let me start off by sharing what my morning routine usually looks like. I would wake up at the very early hour of one in the afternoon, take my phone, open the first app that I see with my blurry vision and start scrolling and scrolling, liking a post, letting out an eventual, you know, that almost laugh that you give because you're so desensitized to everything. What is happening here is that I am activating my mesolimbic pathway, and with each pose that I like, I'm sending a signal in my brain which tells me, oh, I like that, do it again. And so I scroll one more time. And this goes on for hours and hours without ever stopping. And because of that, I begin building tolerance. You know how it is with alcohol, for example. The more you drink it, the bigger the amount you need for it to have the same effect that it initially did. It's the same thing with dopamine. Because I'm bombarding my brain so much with this constant stream of the neurotransmitter, I need more and more of it for it to actually produce the same pleasure that it initially did. And while all of that is happening, I am also not using my mesocortical tract. And I forget how to use it as well. It's not an automatic response anymore. I have to force myself to do it, but I can't because my brain doesn't deem it as worthy. Which leads us to a state of cognitive dissonance. 
What that means is that our thoughts don't resonate with our actions. I logically know that I have to get up and get started on that homework, but my brain is telling me, no, that's not enjoyable. You don't want to do that. You want to scroll for three more hours instead. It's tragic, isn't it? How my own brain is trying to sabotage me. But we've arrived at the last station of this talk. I promised you a solution, didn't I? What we know by now is that the levels of dopamine in our brains have become very irregular because of that constant stream of it. And what we want to do is reach a state of homeostasis, an internal balance, an equilibrium within ourselves. But how do we do that? Well, with a little something known as dopamine detox. However, there is a lot of misinformation about it on the internet, so I'm here today to tell you how to do it properly and get the results that you were promised. First and foremost, most sources would say that dopamine detox is completely depriving your body of dopamine. However, you don't want to do that, because remember how I said even our movements are affected by it? If you stop all dopamine in your brain, you won't be able to get up in the morning. That's not what we're trying to do. Instead, what we want to stop are those behaviors that give us quick, easy, low shots of dopamine constantly. That scrolling, binging those Netflix shows for hours on end, watching those 10 second videos without ever stopping. This is what makes the levels of dopamine in our brains irregular. And what we want to do instead are the executive functions, exactly tasks that require planning and a lot of steps so we can reactivate our mesocortical tract. For example, uh, to-do lists are a very good thing to do. Maybe draw something that requires a lot of steps, right? The second thing that people usually get wrong about dopamine detox is that 24 hours of it is going to completely change your life. That is not true at all. That's like if you stop drinking caffeine for one day, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to feel groggy the whole time and then the next day you're going to drink another three coffees. That's not what you want to do. You need at least nine days to completely flush your system out of the toxin. And you need two to four weeks for nicotine withdrawal symptoms to stop. And it's exactly the same with dopamine. What you want to do is practice it for at least two weeks before you start getting any results. Because I promise you guys, there is a very, very beautiful world hidden beyond our phone screens. And today, I want to invite you to take my hand and come appreciate it with me. So next time, when someone comes up to you and tells you your attention span is lower than a goldfish, you will know that's not true. After all, you've long since trained yours to be much, much higher. <laughs>